you came off, Frawley came on for you and you kind of pointed to yourself, like maybe you wanted to stay out there on the pitch, but then there was ice on your calf afterwards. Was it more of a kind of an injury that you came off for to kind of wrestle? I pointed to myself. Yeah, just like I might have got you coming off when Kieran came on, yeah. No, no, it was the plan. Yeah. It was more of an injury, like I saw it, like there was ice on Johnny's calf oh, then yeah. afterwards. So. Oh, point pointed at yourself, like I might have got you to come off. No, we planned to get, we wanted to get here the exposure that gave him. That's why he made that change in 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a stirring question. <laughs> That's just what I saw. Right, that was, uh, that was interesting. So it was pre planned. Andy, how are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So it was pre planned for him to come off, and the <clears> ice <throat> in the calf was just incidental. Yeah. Seems so. There you go. It was surprising because he, um, he was actually began to find a little bit of form in the game itself. I think he, apart from the first two to three minutes where Leinster were excellent, um, they then became disjointed primarily, I think, because they lost their discipline and because Johnny had a go at, at Finneen Witcherly on that um, very borderline late tackle. But they didn't really find any flow in the game until about three to four minutes before Johnny was subbed off. So it was, I suppose, whether it was you know, pre-planned or not, Given the scoreline, it was um, it was surprising. Yeah, there's no room for wiggle when you're chasing the game. You're like, oh, actually, you know, we want to win this game. <clears throat> we have our pre-plan. We've got to take them off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I was surprised. I mean, I, I wiggle would be the word I'd use. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I would have wiggled it. I would have. Uh, I certainly would have looked at the way the game had panned out and developed. But then again, if you've got, who knows? You know, if you've got. Maybe the Irish camp in one ear as well. I, you know, I don't know the details. I don't know whether Leinster are, are planning on, on Johnny obviously getting two full eighty minutes in the, in the two European games, and they've probably a set amount of minutes that they ought to give him or want to give him in uh, Pro Fourteen matches. But I would have wiggled. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about Munster's performance first. <clears throat> they really needed this because the questions that they were asked in the aftermath of the cash game was would the team from a decade ago have allowed themselves to be bullied and gouged and kicked and not had a response physically in the match and i mean the answer apparently is uh, no we, we can do that too mm. we can, we're, we're we're able to stand toe to toe with anybody yeah they um i i think any aggression that that they showed in the leinster game was uh responsive to to Leinster, Leinster were the were the architects of their own downfall in my mind in terms of um, just being slightly overrated, slightly overly aggressive. I think they were keen to go down to to Thomond and uh, I suppose give the impression they're not being bullied. Um, but I think they overrated it, and as a result, I think Munster's aggression um, came to the fore. But uh, I think it had to be dragged out of them a little bit in that first five minutes or so. Were you surprised that the game took on as much heat as it did? I, yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I was surprised. Yeah, I thought um, I thought Leinster lost their discipline. I thought they lost their usual sense of control, and uh, they weren't. As I mentioned previously, the first two to three minutes they had this kind of a seamless introduction to the game in terms of how they normally play and were very much in control. Um, and then. Johnny's incident with Finney and Witcherly seemed to I, spark a response from his own team. He is the captain and he's the leader and he is aggressive by nature and, and generally that's a positive thing. But I think potentially some of the players, even the senior players like uh, Fardy making a really naive high tackle when the player was almost already in touch, that type yeah. of stuff really doesn't... Uh, strike me as a team that were thinking clearly at that stage. So um, whether they were they were as a group dynamic, they were over egged going into the game. Perhaps too much in the changing room. Perhaps too much chat over Christmas. I'm, I'm I can only speculate, but for sure, looking at their typical style of play versus how they played in that first forty minute first forty minutes against Munster and Thom, and um, it was out of character for that Leinster side. Yeah, I was just about to say, if you expected any team to perhaps go up to that level, you might have expected Munster, given what happens to them in cast as well, that there would have been some sort of response. It's a very uncurrent Leinster thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, um, uh, out of character, by, by that I mean the lack of discipline, and typically um, Leinster would, would be happy to concede 
or, or aiming to concede less than 10 penalties in an 80 minute game and mm-hmm. they conceded 10 in the first 37 minutes um, largely um, all very fair penalties fair calls the only thing Frank Murphy I, you know he was under the spotlight I thought he did really well in that first 40 minutes the only thing he, he arguably missed was uh, Conor Murray's high tackle getting away not being a yellow having already carded Healy for a yellow card for a high tackle so just a, a lack of consistency there but given the pressure that was on Frank as a guy who played for Munster and had played with and against a number of the players on the field I actually thought he did really really well I like the way he explained the decisions especially in the conversations with the TMO I don't think we mm. hear that enough as if like this is the reason why I'm asking you this particular question uh, like, which I don't mm. think we get enough particularly when it comes to Heineken Champions Cup uh, officiating Yeah he was very uh, communicative with his his uh, assistant referee and with si- uh, Simon Wilkinson mm. the, the TMO um, and I, I thought it was it gave good clarity um, there, there were one or two decisions again we pro- probably go f- as far back as the November internationals uh, you're looking at like Farrell's high tackle and not being penalised in November and it sparked a, a controversial debate again. But as a general direction in terms of how the game has been refereed and, and um, changes in, in the approach to high tackles and no arm tackles, I think the message is still being delivered fairly consistently. There were yellow cards, there was a red card for, for James Lowe's tackle. Um, there was a debate on whether Furlong's tackle or, or no arms clear out of the rook could have been red because shoulder made contact with the head. But I think he used... Uh, I think Murphy used common sense. Um, I, well, it's probably better than that he used smart sense. It wasn't just common sense. Yeah. I mean... Um, is Lowe's definitely red? Uh, yeah, I think it was. I think this was, uh, the, the, the way you can probably def- try and defend Lowe is that he's running at full pace, but it's not really good enough defence because the responsibility is on Lowe to run at full pace but protect the guy who's in the air. And he knows that going into the game. It's been fairly clearly outlined as well. So if he uh, uses running full pace as an excuse, it's not good enough. He's, he's got to know that. Um, the heat of the battle, it got to his head, obviously, like a number of the other Leinster players. Yeah, and Furlong's definitely yellow. And I think Furlong's was definitely... Um, a yellow. You, by the letter of the law, you could argue it was a red because shoulder contact to the face should. But I think in this instance with Furlong, he was looking to clear out a rook at a reasonable pace. There was a Munster player behind his own Leinster player. And at the very last second, the Leinster player moved out of the way, at which point yeah. he, couldn't, he couldn't react. But I don't think he targeted anyone's face from a distance with his shoulder. He was looking to hit that rook, make contact with the face. And I, I think both... Uh, Stander, Sexton and Furlong, when that was explained to them very clearly by Murphy, were all accepting of the decision and, and happy with it. Yeah, OK. Uh, in terms of the quality of the performance from Munster, like, how much of this is something that you can build on? Uh, we saw patterns emerge, we saw them playing to a specific game plan, they'll be happy with stuff, or is that there was a fight and they won the fight? No, I think uh, Munster were were constructive. I think um, their line speed and defence was a plus for them um, under pressure in a, in a, in a, a tight game against the European and, and domestic champions. They were able to, to show that they have a, a very strong and aggressive line of defence and that's important under pressure. I think they were constructive in attack. They had the only line break of the first half off, off first phase play, a, a lovely uh, backline play off a line out. Um, was poten- it a bit accidental? Potentially accidental. Was it, a bit, but, it looked uh, like it was supposed to go to Carberry and ends up yeah, onto Earls. Yeah, yeah, I think Carberry let it slide across his body and Earls ran through. I mean, there might um, be like, actually, looking at the video that going, can we do that again? Yeah. Can we yeah. try that again sometime? And I think Earls probably could have linked up with the men outside him as well. Um, he cut back inside. <coughs> um, I, I do think they may look... Again, in terms of what they can build on there, you know, very regularly in the heat of battle in European competition, you're going to be playing against a team with 14 or 13 men, probably less so against 13. But yeah. at 13 men, uh, they'd a scrum in midfield and chose to kick to the corner. Yeah. Um, when Leinster would have had a back rower gone and James Lowe off the field and a midfield scrum, you're probably looking at attacking on either side, two defenders either side. You could stack what you like in terms of attack. I think that was an opportunity missed. However, they did get six points in that ten minute period. So, you know, you're, you're probably splitting the hairs to say they could have gone to the corner and got seven points. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they got six. The so. benefit of that would be though then that you have another front front row on the field again. Yeah. So, like 
it, it, it's exponential. Yes, it's yeah, and, and again, a, a good, a, probably an average coming out of the last two seasons was teams tend to score 10 points in a Symbian period. Okay, right. Yeah, so uh, six is fine, but you yeah. know, ideally they, they could have scored more, yeah. And I certainly, they had a guilt-edged opportunity. They actually had two scrum opportunities that they didn't take. Um, against that 13-man Leinster set. They'd have had Michael Bent on the field for another six yes, or seven minutes to yeah, attack as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, is that just game management or is that...? Yeah. yeah. I think it absolutely is game management and I think uh, O'Mahony not being on the field, Carberry, that's where Carberry needs to really identify that or Conor Murray um, and they really need to kind of step on the Leinster throat at that stage. I think in the second half, um, again, in terms of what Munster can build on, they were constructive again, but they played a lot of rugby just working forward, forwards, kind of one-out runners off Conor Murray. And again, against 14 men as the game and the Leinster team, the game develops in Leinster tire. That's the time, I think, for Joey to step in as a first receiver more regularly and try and get the ball into midfield. And when you get that, that breaks the game up, it breaks up Leinster's defence, and with a man down, yeah. you have a better chance to uh, turn the screw. He um, He's a proper Munster player now. You can see from the uh, delight when the first try goes in, it's like... Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. Now, lads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and rightly so. Yeah. He's got to. You, you've got to. You've got to buy into the ethos. You've got to buy into the spirit of the camp that you're in and uh, the direction you're trying to go. And you know, he's uh, he's dead right. He's he's got to be aggressive and, and go seek out opportunities with Munster like he's done. And um, I think he's doing it reasonably well. I was delighted to see him place kick very well in that in those. Uh, in that mon in that uh, Leinster game, particularly on the back of uh, the Castor game, he was he was striking the ball very well in Castor, but striking it wide, yeah. and nobody cares about that. Yeah. But um, on a consistent basis, I think he's 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 striking the place ball better than he was. Um, and if you keep doing that, generally you get rewarded. And in that pressure situation against Leinster, it was nice to see he converted. Because mm. let's face it, that like that was the first proper time when Joey Carberry had some proper questions about him was after that cast game, and of course they were all knee-jerk questions, especially look at the conditions as well that evening. And he's sort of passed this setback. First of all, there's going to be more setbacks, but he seems like the type of guy who, when he gets a setback, he's going to be able to deal with it in a fairly mature way. Yeah, he he needs to be fairly unflappable in that regard as a ten and an international ten. And, and Johnny's immediate understudy, he's got to show. Um, a resolve f to that type of criticism, and if, if that Castro game is the worst criticism he ever gets as a ten, he's going to have a pretty well. successful career. Yeah. Is so so as understudy getting flung to the ground. Is that uh, dynamic going to be affected? It, like it, we, I, oh, I, I think I think uh, as yeah, Johnny being sure. asked about that, <laughs> I think that's fine. To be honest, I, look, he dragged the, that was off the field. There was a bit of a, a skirmish, and Johnny dragged him out and uh, tried to get him out of the argument, I suppose, and and. Uh, yeah, like a bit of a power struggle there. Should we be happy that they're not going to see each other again before the World Cup, Munster and Leinster? Well, unless there's some sort of Champions Cup uh, miracle draw, really. No, no, I want to see that again now, so right? Why? But yeah. like, really, just for the sake of, no. like, we've we put all our eggs in the basket of the World Cup next year at this point. You said the rivalry was dead, but with all the, the transfers happening between them. Well, it's but, it's well and truly alive, the rivalry. I think it was great that both sides, you know, fully stacked for the first time in a couple of seasons, probably in a domestic yeah. fixture. Um, Texans first game in Tomlin Park in five years. Six and a half years, and a half yeah. Years. And obviously he's going down there as captain as well for the first time. So he was clearly, uh, you know, highly motivated going into that. But uh, yeah, it's, I actually think it's a pity. I think it would do the players good to get another game against each other at that, I suppose, at that intensity. Um, but doesn't, like you said, unless there's uh, a quirk of the kind of European draw. Well, so are Munster back? Like, is, that, is this one performance enough for us to go, okay, they're absolutely, totally and utterly back and the worries that we had from on the back of the cast game, that wasn't the truth. The truth is now. No. Is I would say that's, I think that's overly simplistic. I mean, I suppose back to what is, you know, if they are back, what are they back to? The, the, if you're talking about the, the teams of old that, again, were, it was dragged up in, in post Castro game, would they have lost those matches? Would they have found a way? And I think, to be honest, I think the older Munster team would have found a way to win in Castro. So is this team back to being like that? Uh, no, because I don't think they're going to be like that team. I think they need to be given space to be a different side. I think um, they have a little bit of identity crisis at the moment, I think, down there. I think they're a good side, they're very competitive, 
but they need to establish a clear style of play that works for the group that's currently there. And I think they're finding their way through that. Um, and in terms of their mental toughness and the resolve, I think that's building and, and the Leinster game will be of huge benefit. I think, um, so there's Scannell and Goggin at 12 and 13. Mm. And um, so maybe maybe Scannell is now a first choice mm. starter when everybody is fit. I'm not quite yeah. sure just yet, but yeah. um, I think that if you add Chris Farrell to the team, it changes things. Hugely, and yeah. I think it was also interesting to have Todd Blendell on the bench mm. because now they've depth. Like yeah. if, if Blendell is back to mm. fit, and fingers crossed that he is, like yeah, you know, well, yeah, no, I think Chris Farrell make quite a difference to well, certainly to the Munster squad. I actually think Farrell is going to you know come through and, and make a difference for the Irish squad come Six Nations potentially, and certainly by World Cup time. I think I think Farrell's. Uh, gone under the radar recently because of the injury, but I I think he's a superb player, and it was it was notable. Munster ran a ball from from left to right off a scrum, and I think Goggin passed it straight into touch off his left hand, and and I suppose in a very simple way, I know I know Goggin is better than that as a player, but it's the type of thing that Farrell does with his eyes closed, you know, in his sleep. Um, he attracts defenders simply by his size and by his his aggressive running lines, but to be able to make passes on the run like that as a distributor adds a dimension to Munster's game that they haven't had for a while. Yeah. I think if you add in the likes of Carberry, Murray at nine, Carberry ten, Scannell as a, as a very footballing type 12 with a nice left boot and a game management type of 12 that he is and a guy like Farrell outside, I'd, I'd argue that's probably their their, the their best combination yeah. um, with a, the likes of Blaindal and Hanrahan who again has blown hot and cold but when he's hot, he's hot and um, they are developing depth. I think I think nine probably Matheson coming in there has been a help but um, they're potentially a bit slim in certain areas relative to Leinster for example. Yeah. Like on that identity crisis that Munster may be going through, a lot of that probably has to be down to, I guess, a turbulent last 15 months uh, mm. down there as well with the change sure. of the coach, with uh, other instances as well. I felt like they were trying to, to get rid of water from the boat at, at certain stages. Like, is that part of it? Is, is it down to what you talked about there, that when they get the right players in the right positions, they just have a team that makes sense and it really is just down to personnel? Or, or is it down to the coach? Like, what is the coach's desire for the team to have the identity? Yeah, well, I... I, I I tend to lean towards the coach down in Munster needs to really shape how they're going to play. And in an, in an ideal setting, the coach does that by getting the best out of the personnel he has. So it ought to change from squad to squad how you're going to play. I mean, for a coach to come in um, with the same script and 30 different players to who he coached five years ago doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think there's a small cultural shift going on in the sense that the traditional you know, metrics for success then in Munster rugby were, were a very strong forward pack and probably a, a, a tactically gifted 10 like O'Gara who played largely a good kicking game and a territorial game. Um, and that isn't uh, Joey Carberry's strength. And they sought out Joey Carberry. So if they if they want to bring in Joey and try and put a square peg in a round hole and make him like Raj was, they're going to have trouble because it's not his strength. If they're going to bring him in and be critical that they don't have a you know a, an eight to ten man game like they used to have, it's a bit incongruous. Why would they go and seek out a guy like Carberry if they wanted? They could have gone and got a guy like Ross Byrne, for example, who'd have probably done that better. Yeah. So um, I'm sure that was in their thought process when they went and got him. Yeah, absolutely. So I think they've got to allow for that, and they've got to allow for the skills he'll bring, which are undoubted. And I think they have an opportunity to, to be a bit more courageous than they've been in the past in terms of how they play the game. Um, it's not being foolhardy, um, and there are going to be games like they had in Castro where it's rainy, wet and wintry, and putting the ball on the floor and in behind back three players is, is just, you know, that's a home truth you can't get away from. You've got to do that in certain European games. But as a general style, I think they have an opportunity with the personnel they have. Certainly if you look at their back row, uh, strength and depth, their 9, 10, 12, 13 first choices, and, and the likes of Earls out wide. Uh, and Haley now, who looks to be really strong, um, they have an opportunity to develop their game into a bit more of an expansive game as a as a first port of call for them. Um, but it remains to be seen will there be afforded time to do that. Mm. Um, uh, Connacht played really well in the game against Leinster and just came up a little bit short, mm. and um, then played really well in the game after that and didn't come up short. It looks like there's the 
the bones of a team who you could <coughs> see being a proper Heineken Cup team over the next couple of years there. Yeah, and I think, um, isn't it, the first three in, in each conference are getting automatic qualification for Europe, and I think they're gone, they dropped down into fourth, I think, as a result of the Christmas results. Is that right? I don't know. I can, I can yeah, check I that think, for you. Uh, but either way, they're there, thereabouts for, for automatic qualification. Um, it's not there. Which is a, the yeah, so, yeah, so it's a huge carrot for, Mons for Connacht. Um, you know, we can't really underestimate when you look at what's happened with United and Mourinho and Solskjaer and obviously to with a slightly lesser focus globally on Connacht Rugby last year where they weren't a happy camp with Kieran Keane. Yeah. And just the change in management, what it's done to invigorate or reinvigorate a lot of key players down there. Um, happy players generally are better players and guys who are given opportunities and feel positive going into work every day are generally guys who will perform better. And I think Connacht have... Uh, have managed to change that and develop that from Kieran Keane's reign. I think it's showing. Yeah, and the value for um, for them for being consistently in the Heineken Cup would just be transformative, particularly when you're trying to put a new uh, ground together and just mm. remind everybody that this is a, a viable business and we actually have a fourth professional team that uh, not that not that is a question anymore, but that it had been a question for so long that like if they're not qualifying for the Heineken Cup every year as a matter of course, then they're nowhere near as useful to Irish rugby as they could be. Yeah, um, well, they've also generated a lot of goodwill and, and momentum and support down in, in Galway City. Like, when I was playing down in Connacht, you know, you'd do well to get a couple of thousand at a match. That yeah. was, albeit 10 years ago. Um, but now... What was that like? Probably, did, did, was there a sense, like, <clears throat> that you weren't connected to the city? Well, no, it was just the sense that it wasn't, at the time, it felt rugby wasn't the priority down there, um, and, and very understandably so. But now I suppose you're looking at at a time when, when you know, Galway hurlers, but I suppose that's more the outskirts of the county in Galway as opposed yeah. to the city. It's just that the, the, the city identifies with a sporting team of success. Did you live in Galway or would you have commuted back and forth? Well, I lived in Galway, yeah. yeah. And I lived in East Galway, uh, East City of Galway. Yeah part of Galway in Roscam, yeah. Did people know you were a rugby player? No, no. Uh, people didn't know I was a rugby player in England or Leinster either. Yeah. So. <laughs> it didn't bother me at that stage. No, but it's just uh, interesting, you know, it's like, oh, you know, yeah. there's Andy, he plays for, he plays for Connacht. It's like, yeah, I don't know, think that would have been the case the particularly, the game, not really. You, know, you could have, could have stood game, beside but. anyone in O'Connell's having a pint yeah. and they wouldn't have known the difference. But the modern day Connacht player, um, probably can't do that, or if they can, they're recognised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, it. I mean, that's the yeah. No, that's a huge positive. The, the yeah, transformation yeah, of the whole thing. Absolutely. And where Ulster at the moment? What's the? Yeah, I, I think Ulster. Um, I suppose to to counter argue where we are with with Munster, for example, and and that I suppose trying to find an identity and style with which they they play. I think Ulster have have carved out a very clear. Uh, identity in terms of what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to play. They, they've embraced risk, they play a, a, a lot of offloads, they've got a few of them wrong, um, they've shipped a few bad results as a result, but they're improving. And I think it's very much a model that Dan McFarland's brought over from his experience with Townsend uh, in Glasgow and yeah. then in Scotland. Um, and I think it's quite progressive, I think it's very positive for Irish rugby and I think Ulster rugby, I suppose, is walking to a whole different beat and rhythm compared to last year, which wouldn't be hard. Yeah. So. In a weird way, it's kind of like the flip side of Munster almost. I know you made the comparison there, but in terms of the areas of the pitch they needed to focus on, because mm. Munster traditionally quite strong up front, and then you're saying that it's the, the identity of the backs they need to work on, whereas Ulster last season in particular were just getting destroyed up front all the mm. time, and they're potentially world-class backs in a lot of positions last year in particular, like with the likes of Leili Fano, just weren't getting the opportunities mm. because they were getting killed. Are you looking at a scrum this year that is far better in the long run, that is holding its own and can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best in Europe? Yeah, I think the most instructive thing I heard or, or read about the, the Ulster forward pack in recent history was Rory Best's comment, com comments coming back from the Six Nations where he said it just felt very, very different. I mean, it was a very pointed and marked probably criticism of his teammates and he is the captain and it's his right to do that. But he said previously going away to Irish camp in November when I came back it felt like the guys had been on a bit of a holiday. When he right. went when he when he went into a set scrum and a training scrum 
having come back from a Joe Schmidt camp, he said it was a notable drop in intensity and concentration levels. This Pretty time, good he, coaches as well. Yeah, uh, but this time he came back from the November internationals and he said they were right at the pitch and level that he expected and wanted from them. So there's probably no better indication from your hooker in the middle of the front row and captain to 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 demonstrate change that is happening up there, positive change. Um, and again, being coached by a guy like Dan, who is a self-confessed scrum nerd, and you know, if there's going to be a strength in his coaching armory, it's got to be the scrum. He played there probably for you know 10, 15 seasons as a professional, coached as a as a scrum specialist before he developed into assistant coach roles and head, and his first head coach role now. So, um, absolutely, that's a a, a positive. Uh, aspect of Ulster's development, yeah. Okay, a couple of quick comments for you here. Uh, Connacht destroying Ulster was a fantastic highlight, says Darrow Tool, hashtag O2BAM. Uh, and Niall G, the bite is back, question mark. The bite was never gone. I'm sure if you ask any Leinster or Munster player, they would tell you that. Um, well, let's just wait and see what happens in the uh, coming years. Um, Dean Purcell says, I think the game has almost saved the rivalry if Leinster ran away with it or even won by a score or two. It would have been another nail in the coffin of the fixture. The Aviva should be rammed next year. I, I'm assuming that pick their full teams. Like yes, yeah. Um, and it, that, it was quite circumstantial, I think, that they picked the full teams this year. I don't think they just, um, on, a, on a whim, decided they're both going to pick full sides. Yeah. It's just as the season has panned out, as the, the conference league tab table develops, as the, the demands of the Irish management and the way things are set up, it just happened to be good timing. And they both went full sides, uh, apart from Oman, obviously in the couple of Leinster injuries. But um, it would be great, seeing as they don't play each other that regularly, to see two fully stacked sides. But I don't think it's going to be that regular an occurrence. Uh, Morris Reardon has an interesting question here. Yeah. Why do you guys think it's so difficult for opposition teams to stay within the rules of the game when playing against Munster? The Cavs game and the Leinster game being prime examples of this. Is it something that's happening in reaction to the way Munster play, both dominated around the Rook area and perhaps frustration at that, that carried over? I mean, that is a bit of victim blaming there by Morris, but uh, you know. Your tone mm. would suggest you agree with it, Ger. It's an interesting question. Well, I suppose he's, you know, the, the likes of Ty Byrne, for example, who's so strong um, over the tackler and, and is a guy that's very hard to shift. Fellas might be a bit more aggressive in terms of how they enter the rook to clear the likes of Ty Byrne, but I don't think as a general rule, um, monster style of play is, is you know, predicating bad behaviour from everybody else. What does Tyburn have to do now to, to get in the Ireland team? Do you have to kill somebody? Because like yeah, Not a lot, I would have thought. He's he's damn close. He's um it's just strength and depth in, in terms of that position though. I mean Toner was outstanding in the New Zealand game. Ryan has been outstanding in almost every professional game he's played. Yeah. Um, Even in defeat, he was pretty good. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know... He's got that thing where... It's very hard to argue Byrne gets in ahead of either of them on top form, but he's damn close. And, um, you know, that's it's pretty tough for Ty Byrne because in recent 10 to 15 years, you know, we've had O'Connell, we've had O'Callaghan, we've had Mal O'Kelly. Um, there's, it's been a position we've been strong in, but I would have thought at other points in history he'd have been a shoe in to start in an Irish team based on his current form. He yeah. just happens to be behind Ryan and Toner at the moment. Ryan has this thing where, um, you know those old assault courses where uh, you would go under the net, or yes. you can kind of just do that, uh, like even though he's you know a thousand foot tall and yeah. everybody's trying to tackle him, he can just crawl along the ground. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure did you see Brian O'Driscoll's tweet the other day. His question was, can James Ryan carry like he does for 10 or 12 years? I'm not sure. The punishment he takes, his ability to make two or three yards when he has no right to, is unrivaled. Well, with maybe the exception of CJ, he says. Well, I, I think there's a, there's a slight contradiction in, in that, in terms of Brian's tweet, and that can he, can he carry like that for 10 to 12 years? He's not taking a lot of punishment because of the way he carries. If he carried differently, he'd keep running into people. That's what all the other players do. He avoids contact better than anyone. So by that rationale, he's not taking as much punishment. If he was just running directly into the smash, the traffic, like most of his peers, he'd take a lot more punishment. So I actually think it's it will elongate his career the way he plays to avoid contact. He, like you said, the assault course. The capacity to drop his height from six foot six to one foot six uh, is is remarkable. Um, but also, I think there's a lot in terms of his game intelligence, his anticipation of lines to run, to attack space, his his uh, almost telepathic relationship at times with either Conor Murray or Luke McGrath. In terms of they seem to pick him out off the side of a rock where they can't pick anyone else out in space. Mm -hmm. So he's there's a lot to his game that goes. Uh, I suppose 
underappreciated as well. But I'd actually disagree with Brian to a degree on that. It'll be hard for him to carry and play at that level for ten to twelve years. But I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's relentlessly physical on his body to avoid contact. Sure. Did Luke McGrath do enough in that game to be number two? Um, well, probably probably not. Um, but neither are any of the other number twos. Um, I I can't quite fathom why all Irish scrum halves are box kicking five metres ahead of themselves in our own 22. That includes Conor Murray, Luke McGrath, Kieran Marmion. I don't know why we're doing that when we've got a lot of tens who could stand in the pocket and drill at 60 metres. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's nonsensical, it's a strategy and, and tactic that's been used for about 18 months relentlessly in Irish rugby and yeah. I don't get it. Is it a direction from on high? <laughs> Well, it, if it was, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, at best, you're 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 get a fifty-fifty chance to recover the ball with with wingers chasing it. If you lose the ball, the opposition have it five meters further down the field. Yeah, I don't get it. You give it to your ten, kick it sixty meters, give up the fifty-fifty battle for possession, and trust your defense fifty meters down the field. So you remove the risk that one of your players might get sent off. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's a, an added fringe benefit of that. This a uh, quick look at the fixtures coming up um, this weekend on uh, Airsport Connacht against Ulster. Um, that's obviously done. It's the bottom three oh, here, yeah. yeah. So, um, Leinster, Ulster, the fifth. Today's the second, so I guess that makes that Saturday. Saturday. It says it there as well. There you go. There you go. That was helpful, yeah. <laughs> that's a <part> of the <laughs> glasses. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, the other game on Saturday is Connacht against Munster kicking off at 7.35. So, 5.15 kickoff for Leinster against Ulster on Airsport 1, uh, followed by Connacht against Munster also on Airsport 1 this week, uh, this weekend. Um, Andy, good stuff. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, Jared. Um, so we're going to win the World Cup this year. That's how this conversation finishes. That's how every conversation should finish up until. <laughs> we've we've the best chance we've ever had. I mean, yeah, but yeah, definitely. But um, I my my concern is the amount of rooks we we take to win a game. That's my only concern. Is we it we just average a about one hundred and forty relative to the other. Our, our, our peer kind of top four or five teams in the world are averaging about eighty rooks to win an oh, international. Right. So. Um, that's the, count, the counter argument. I mean, we've about 55, 60 more rooks than our our surrounding competition to win a game, um, which is you know a uh, pretty high amount of workload extra to to back to back do that six times in a row, seven times in a row to win a World Cup is going to be hard. But the counter argument is we're very good at it, and um, we're very good at maintaining possession, and we've got strength and depth probably three deep in most positions, which could sustain playing that way. Yeah. So, so it's like it's very feasible. Oper operational human shield is the first. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Andy, good stuff. Thanks very much. Uh, 